start, before we get into kind of the, the massive, nasty question we ended with, was looking at our conversion factors. That's pretty much everything we've done so far this semester. The first section for de determining our conversion factors between measurements came from Unit 2. Okay. Uh, subscripts or determining conversion factors for the number of atoms coming from our subscripts from our formulas. I would argue it's kind of a mix of Unit 1 and 2 because we first looked at formulas in Unit 1. The number of molecules coming from a balanced chemical reaction. Well, that's the current unit. That's a parenthesis thing. Unit 3, the number of moles coming from our formulas or equations is really Unit 3. And then our atomic or molecular mass, depending on which one you want to look at, is Unit 1 or Unit 3. Okay. So you are able to do all of the conversions that we've talked about so far this semester by finding access to each of, this, each of these bits of pieces of information. Okay. You are responsible for everything on this and knowing those conversion factors. Some of them are provided for you. If we look at back up the top of the measurements, it says English will be provided on the exam. That's referencing the English to metric conversions. Okay. Those are given to you. Okay, if you're expected to use it. Everything else, you're responsible for knowing where to find it or having had it memorized. Okay. A slightly different organization of this, uh, as far as bits and pieces to remember, our units have two pieces. So when we look at a unit, we have the measurement, grams, milliliters. Okay. But we also have the substance that is tied to that unit. So I can convert the grams of one substance into a different unit of that same substance, but I can't change the, the measurement and the substance at the same time. I can only convert one at a time. Okay. Um, as far as finding that information, all that information was up on our previous slide. This is all put together in a method known as dimensional analysis, setting up those steps. Okay. That's everything we've been doing as far as the method has been dimensional analysis. It can be broken into individual steps, but that's kind of up to you if you want to do that or if you want to run it as dimensional analysis, the big long line. At the bottom, we've got kind of a conversion starting with atoms or molecules of A and then how we could convert across all the way to atoms or molecules of B and what we could go through to go through and solve that. Each of those conversions is reversible. Right, so when we think about equations that you want to memorize, it's really hard to say, well, I want to memorize this one equation to solve because I could go either direction. So if I just understand the process of dimensional analysis, I don't have to memorize multiple equations. Right, that's the point behind all of this. Right, once we have a method that we're comfortable, comfortable with for our conversion system, that's when we scale in our chemistry, and that's what we ended with on Thursday. So if we take a mass of some sample, we react it with a mass of another sample, which could have been made more tricky, uh, and then we obtain a final mass. Okay, we want to know what the percent yield was. Okay, so this is the, one of the big goals out of chemistry. We start with a whole bunch of stuff, we throw it all together, what should we expect to get out of it compared to how much I got out of it? Right. Say I run an experiment and I get a 70% yield, but somebody else goes through and gets an 80% yield. Well, now they get more fame for doing that reaction because they got a better yield. Right. So a lot of what we're doing as chemists is trying to refine our process to make sure we maximize the yield anytime we run a reaction. So how do we calculate a percent yield? Our percent yield is the actual, so what you obtain from the experiment over the theoretical. <coughs> Officially, times 100%. The actual can be referred to as the experimental value. The theoretical can be referred to as a calculated value. 
So the theoretical is always going to involve some kind of calculation. The actual should be explicitly given to you. So if we go back to our question, are we given either of those values? Yes. Yeah, what are we given? Actual. We are told the actual yield of our magnesium chloride. We're told the actual is 60 grams. And because magnesium chloride is a long word, we could write it out as the formula to simplify it. And I then want to divide by the theoretical. Okay. What units should that theoretical yield be? Grams is partially correct. Grams of magnesium chloride. So I need to somehow figure out the grams of magnesium chloride that could have theoretically come out of my experiment, which means I'm doing a limiting reagent calculation. and call this an LR, which sets us up for the long, tedious path ahead. Am I given how much magnesium chloride I could have theoretically made? Well, I'm only given what I start with, so what do I have to do? 50.6 gram, was it 50.6? Yeah, magnesium hydroxide. And I need to convert that into grams of magnesium chloride. Was that the only starting material I was given? No, I was also given information about the hydrochloric acid. I was given 45.0 grams of hydrochloric acid. That should be converted into the magnesium chloride. Anybody know the, fa uh, the phase of hydrochloric acid? It's aqueous. It's usually dissolved in solution because hydrochloric acid is actually a gas. It's not safe to work with as a gas, so we dissolve it into solution. Okay? Which means this question is actually being kind of accidentally nice. Would we measure out 45 grams of hydrochloric acid? No, what we would likely measure out is a volume of a certain molarity of hydrochloric acid, and we'd have another conversion that we'd have to slide into this. Okay. So, should we give you time to try and work through it? I hear it. Yeah? Okay. Work through. See what you can come up with. If you've got questions, raise your hand. I'll come to you. But I want you to spend a little bit of time trying to get this figured out. Let's go ahead and work through the top one, just the magnesium hydroxide to the magnesium chloride. And again, we want to think through the approach. We're following the approach, not the answer. So what you should be asking yourself are these questions, and that's what you should be writing down, not so much the answer. So when we compare left to right, magnesium hydroxide to, or sorry, grams of magnesium hydroxide to grams of magnesium chloride, what are we changing? The substance. How do we change the substance? Only through moles. Which means the first step should be convert to moles. How do we convert grams of magnesium hydroxide into moles of magnesium hydroxide? That's from our periodic table. And I'm going to need someone to give me a number. How about Aspen? You just give me your number. Thank you, Aspen. Oh, mother of God. <laughs> Three different answers. Okay. Oxygen is 16, there's two of them, so there's 32. Magnesium is 24. Four hydrogens, eight, zero, so I get 60. Did I add that up right? Four hydrogens, what are you talking about? Just testing, just testing. I get 58. So we got, okay, that's the number we're running on. 58.1, 3, 3. Okay, does everybody catch that? Follow that work? Okay, sorry for that 4 for our hydrogen. What unit are we now in? We're in moles of magnesium hydroxide. No, I should be sorry, I was wrong. 
Okay. Are moles magnesium hydroxide the same thing as grams of magnesium hydroxide? What changed? Mm, yeah, just moles. So, yeah. What changed between moles of magnesium hydroxide and grams of magnesium chloride? The weight and the amount. The measurement, grams to moles, and the substance. Okay. Substances are trickier to, to convert, so let's deal with getting rid of the substance. To convert the substance, I need to get rid of the moles of magnesium hydroxide, and I will convert those into moles of magnesium chloride. Moles of magnesium chloride. Okay. The example that I walked around and gave a few people, I give you five wheels. How many vehicles can you make? One. I think you can make two. Oh, I'm making bicycles, not cars. Why did, why the confusion? Oh, Said vehicle. A bicycle is a vehicle. Okay. To answer the question appropriately, we have to know both what we're starting with and what we're ending with. We need an equation. Yes. You could make five vehicles. Fair enough. Okay. Vehicle is ambiguous. We have to have a way to relate those. How do we relate those? Through a balanced equation. What are we starting with? What are we starting with? Thank you. We're starting with magnesium hydroxide. What are we reacting that with? Hydrogen. Hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, which becomes what? Magnesium chloride. Is that it? And HOH. How did you know it was making HOH? You're recognizing based on the starting materials that this could be a double replacement reaction. Officially, it is better known as a neutralization reaction. Because you are expected to be able to predict those products, you need to finalize that equation. Okay? That was unit two. Is it balanced? How do you know? Okay, let's pick the chlorides. Cl on the left? One. Cl on the right? Two. Not balanced. How do we fix it? Two HCl. So now the chlorides are balanced. Is it balanced yet? No. no. What do we have to do? Check every single freaking element. Okay? Don't take shortcuts. Okay? The only people that can take shortcuts at this point is anybody that scored above a 95 on both the exams. I think that might be two people. Everybody else needs to do everything else. Okay? In that process, we end up finding out that we need 2HOH. We good? How many moles of magnesium chloride are in the number that shows up in my now? One. Moles of magnesium chloride, there's one. Moles of magnesium hydroxide, one. Where did those numbers come from? Yeah. No, it was not from the periodic table. They were the coefficients from the balanced equation. Yes. Question real quick on just for formatting you're doing. For HOH, does it hurt us at all to just make it H2O? So, and I get this question every so often. Uh, I will admit that when I went through and solved, I always wrote it as H2O. Always. And then some student came along and said, can I write HOH? I said, well, yeah, you can, but then it's not H2O. Like, well, but isn't the H still... Yeah, okay, fine, sure. So it is still H2O, but it's not formatted properly according to a formula. Okay, H2O is more correct as a formula. Okay, well, then I was like, well, okay, well, why would you write HOH? What made H2O? An H and... OH, or hydroxide. By writing it out as HOH, what have they done? They've now made it a little bit easier to see how to balance the equation. Okay. 
because they're now grouping hydroxide as its own term. Either is perfectly valid as far as this class is concerned. Officially, you should be writing H2O because, well, that's the proper way to write a formula. Right? Are there multiple ways to write a formula? Yes. But there's officially only one proper way to write a formula. Okay. So either is perfectly valid. It just comes down to your perspective. I feel the HOH is easier to see. So I, oh, as far as I know, I've always written it as HOH for this class. Okay. What unit will we now be in? Moles of magnesium chloride. Moles of magnesium chloride. What's different about moles of magnesium chloride and grams of magnesium chloride? Just the measurement. So I want moles of magnesium chloride on the bottom, and I want grams of magnesium chloride on top. This could be a fun one. What number do we get for the grams? I've got a 95.2. Going once, twice, okay. What would we do for the hydrochloric acid? Go through the exact same process in each of those stages we incorporate the proper numbers. Where we're gonna get a number difference is in our mole-mole conversion. Because when we look at our hydrochloric acid, the mole-mole conversion is not one to one, it's two to one, okay? Make sense? Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit. And by cleaning it up a little bit, we're going to clean it up a lot. The 50.6 grams of magnesium hydroxide led to how many grams of magnesium chloride? All right, a 90... No, that was the grams per mole, was the 95. So when you run the calculation, all of those calculations, because we wrote that out as the calculator, you take the numerator, multiply them through, the denominator, multiply them through, divide the numerator by the denominator, and we get 82.6 grams of magnesium chloride, conveniently given to me in two sig pigs. Nice. And the 45.0 grams of hydrochloric acid we go through all of its calculations, we end up with, what was the number? I heard 58.6. If you got 100 something, I'm going to guess you didn't factor in the 2. Remember, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. Which of those two was the most I could make? Why the 58.6? That's the smaller number. It's the limiting reactant. I pick the smaller of those two numbers. I run out of hydrochloric acid. I have an excess of the magnesium chloride. The most I could possibly make was 58.6. So I have to calculate that number. Did I have to calculate 58.6? Those of you that said 58.6, you just go, Whoa, and there it was. <laughs> Who went blah and got that number? Because I would give you half a dozen other questions just to watch you go blah and get the number. <laughs> that number was calculated. You had to punch that into the calculator to come up with some special number. Because it was calculated, it is known as the theoretical yield. So I can take that number and I can dump it into my percent yield question. The theoretical was shown on the bottom, so what do I do? I take my 58.6. Do I really need to change the green color? Is it good enough for the moment? I just promise not to use it again. Okay. 58.6, just look at the other screen. 58.6, so we take 60, divided by 58.6, multiply by 100, and we get... 
percent. Now we could throw in some extra numbers if we wanted, but we only need three sig figs. There's our three sig figs. We get 102 percent yield. Can I get more than I started with? Can we create or destroy matter? No. No. So what does that mean? You know what this means on the test? Oh, crap. I did it wrong. It must be 58.6 divided by 60. Because then when I do that, I get a number less than 100%. And that makes physical sense. So that must be the answer. And guess what? That answer shows up on the test. And that answer is wrong. This is the correct answer. Okay. Percent yield is calculated as actual over theoretical. Is that what we did in our calculation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did we get a number greater than 100%? Yes. Does it make physical sense to create matter? No. What does that mean? It could mean a couple things. I mean, one, Nobel Prize, but... <laughs> Some kind of experimental error. What was that experimental error? Had a spouse or something like that, or, or siblings are standing on, on the scale, the weigh thingy, figure out what their weight is, and you stick your toe up there and you just lean on it a little bit. And they're like, oh my god, I gained 30 pounds. How did that happen? You're like, ah, that's funny. <laughs> it's really entertaining. You should do that if you haven't done that already. Okay? You could have misweighed something, which means the weight is now off. Okay? That's a pretty bad mistake on your part. What else could have happened? Well, it's a solid product. A solid product that came out of what? Out of a liquid. What liquid? An aqueous solution. What's the liquid? Begins with a W. Water. Or an H, depending on your perspective. Get it? Water. What's the issue with water? Water has weight. How do we get rid of the water? Heat. You guys did the copper lab this week, right? For those of you in the Tuesday... Oh, you're all Tuesday lab. Mm -hmm. huh. You already did, so you can tell everybody. Okay? You have to remove the water once you isolate the solid. How do we remove the water? You heat it up. You boil off the water so that it's no longer on the scale because if we went in and weighed it wet, we're not getting the weight of magnesium chloride. We're getting the weight of magnesium chloride and water. So we have to evaporate off the water. How do we know we've evaporated off the water? It could weigh less. But if you evaporate it off, let's say one molecule of water, won't it weigh less? Technically. What if there was 50,000 water molecules? I remove one, does it weigh less? Yeah. Okay, but now there's still, what did I say, 49,999 left that's still contributing to the weight. So I remove another one. How do I know I've removed all the water? How do you know it's dry? You heat it up, you let it cool down, you weigh it. You heat it up again. If there's no water left, what happens to the weight? It stays the same. So you take it off, you let it cool down, you weigh it again. Did the weight change? Yep, keep heating it. Nope, you're done heating. You've removed all the water. So what did that mean? Someone probably did not remove all the water and in a rush to get out of the lab, skipped that last step and just said, oh, it was the same. And they go through and run the calculations. They end up with 102% and the grader goes, ha, ha. You did bad technique, minus 20 points. That might be a bit stiff. Right? So this is why we have proper lab protocols. We can account for yields that don't make physical sense through human error. That does not mean the calculation was wrong. Why do we ask it in this way on the exam? Because the instant that you step onto the exam, you assume everything is perfect. Don't make those assumptions, okay? Because everybody knows. You want to say that a little bit louder? There we go, because I can't say that at least not while being recorded. Okay? 
So don't make those assumptions. Right? This is particularly relevant. Right? There is a time in the not too distant future where this kind of question will show up. You might go, but this was a really long question. That's true. How could we simplify this question down? Uh, da, da, da. Let's shorten this equation down. So we're given all those numbers, and we had one extra sentence. The whoops. <clears throat> what we say was fifty-eight point two. Three three. How much of all that work that we had shown needs to still show up? Not a whole lot, right? The percent yield equals the actual, which was 60.0 grams of magnesium chloride divided by the theoretical or the calculated, which was 58. Point was it really 33? It was 6. Eh, I was right. Close enough. Three, three, six. Pretty close. Three plus three is six. Yeah. Numerology, man. We didn't turn it in the calculator now. We get 102% yield. Oh, my God. I used, must have used the wrong numbers. So instead of using 60 and 58.6, I'm going to use uh, 45 and 58.6. Why are the other numbers given? To confuse you, really. There's no other reason there. If we just gave you the calculated yield and the percent yield, there's only two answers that you could use. You divide one by the other. How do we get the other three wrong answers? Magic. They'd be random magic numbers. So we have to throw in a bunch of other random numbers just to say if you randomly punch buttons into a calculator and hit enter, did one of those other random answers show up? Yes. Okay. So in the uber simplified version, there will be a bunch of other random numbers. You have to make sure you pull the correct numbers. The numbers you need, the theoretical yield, also known as the calculated yield, and the actual yield, or experimental. Make sense? Okay. Because we talked about process before, some people went through and tried to do everything. I don't know why it's not erasing everything, but it's good enough. Okay. Try to go through and solve this. What I would recommend you do is, again, come up with a process. Okay. What steps did you have to go through and do? Okay. Because that's the idea. What is your process? When I look at this question, these are minimally what I see. I need to know the formula for magnesium hydroxide and for hydro hydrochloric acid. I need to know the type of reaction. I need to know the products produced. I need a balanced equation. I need the maximum yield of magnesium hydroxide as the limiting reagent. The maximum yield of hydrochloric acid as the limiting reagent. Identifying the real limiting reagent. Determining the actual and theoretical yields and actually calculating the percent yield. Okay. That was what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps. And I'm condensing a lot. Hydrochloric acid and magnesium hydroxide. Really, that's... That's two steps. We're up to 10. Okay. Products, there's two products yielded. So there's 11. Okay. Determining the yield, I need to know the molecular weights of the compounds. So there's another three steps. Okay. To solve this question, we're looking at 15, 16 steps. Okay. You have to be able to recognize how and where to do each of those steps. Believe it or not, you have that ability. Just prove that on the exam, please. Okay. Questions about our limiting reactants or percent yields? <laughs> Sorry, what? What is the term for the reactant in a chemical reaction that does not determine the theoretical yield? Okay, which reactant determined the theoretical yield up here? 
Anybody remember? It was the hydrochloric acid. Which reactant did not? Magnesium hydroxide. We did not determine the yield because it was in excess. There was too much of it. So what is the name of the reagent that did not determine the yield? The excess reagent or the reactant in excess. Okay. So for those of you that have looked at the practice exam, might have some concept of what she was asking about. Those of you that have not, look at the practice exam. Okay. Which gets us into our last kind of section, which means we might even end early today. We'll see how we get through this. Empirical formulas. Okay. When we looked at, uh, say, magnesium chloride or sodium chloride, what is our formula for sodium chloride? What is our formula for magnesium chloride? Okay. Why was it NaCl? We have sodium and chloride. Give me a little bit more than that. I think I heard a positive and a negative. Sodium is plus one, and chloride is minus one. So we picked NaCl because the charges need to balance, right? The charge is balanced. No, because now I have three positives, right? How about now? Why did I not say sodium chloride is Na3Cl3? Okay. In an ionic compound, we go to the reduced ratio. So when we look at ionic compounds, they are already in their empirical formula. It is the smallest ratio possible for ionic compound. When we move to magnesium chloride, it's MgCl2. Why is it that? Magnesium is a plus 2, chloride's a minus 1. Couldn't I have had Mg2Cl4? That balances out the charge. Why is that not considered valid? It's not the fully reduced ratio. And that's because in our ionic compounds, when they combine to make their larger structures, they're very repetitive. Okay? They form these small repeating units, and the whole cycle scales out. Okay? Benzene. Anybody know the formula for benzene? I didn't expect you to, so you don't have to feel bad. We draw out the structure for benzene. What is the formula for benzene? How many carbons are there? Six. How many hydrogens are there? Six. Is that the same idea as our salts, our ionic compounds? No, because the ionic compound should say that that formula is? CH. Why do we not just call it CH? Why do we have to call it C6H6? The six carbons and the six hydrogens combine always in this format. If I bring in another six carbons, they will not get attached to this structure. They are a separate molecule from it. Molecular compounds have molecules. This is why we call them molecular. That's the molecule part of it. Ionic compounds, we don't have molecular formulas. Officially, we have... I already forgot the stupid name of it. Uh, unit structure, unit formula, something like that. Okay. The formula unit, ding, there it is. It's the formula unit. Okay. Why do we call it the formula unit and not a molecular formula? Well, because in an ionic compound, it's not a molecule, it's a collection of atoms. Okay. In a molecular compound, it's not a collection of atoms, it's a molecule. Okay. The difference is that in a molecule, we have distinct chemical connections between them. Okay? Once we've satisfied those connections, it's done. It can't make more connections. In ionic compounds, we can continue to layer these compounds out to greater and greater extents. Okay? 
So the molecular compound has a slightly different formula system than an ionic compound. How do we tell the difference? Why are the ones sodium chloride and magnesium chloride ionic and benzene not ionic? Not really charges, I don't care. How do we know something's ionic? Metal and a nonmetal. How do we know it's not ionic? They're nonmetals. Carbon and hydrogen are both <coughs> nonmetals. So they fit in the molecular system. Okay. So if I was to look at benzene and for some reason evaluate it as the empirical formula, I would write it as just CH. That removes a lot of information about benzene as a compound. That doesn't tell me anything about how the carbons are connected. Right, so formulas are ultimately pretty useless. I want to have a structure. The structure allows me to see that connectivity, and I can do, then do something about the predicting of the reaction. So why do we then talk about empirical formulas? Okay, it's kind of a historical aspect. If we went through to study, say, a molecular compound, we could devise ways to determine the composition of, say, carbon and hydrogen in our compound. That composition would be associated back to the mass, which we can then, using the periodic table, determine moles. And really all that does is tell us the ratio of carbon to hydrogen in a giant sample of that compound. It doesn't tell us the formula of the compound, okay, until we add more information. Okay? So what we're looking at is the difference between an empirical formula and a molecular formula. The empirical formula is the fully reduced ratio. The molecular formula is some scale up of the empirical formula. For instance, benzene was six times the size of the empirical formula because it, all of them had six, six hydrogens, six carbon. Okay. So our molecular, to determine our molecular formula, we need to know our empirical formula, and we have to know the molecular mass. Okay. Both of those are kind of challenging things to come up with experimentally, but they're given to us in a, in a question. The empirical formula is a little bit different. The empirical formula will start with some kind of unit conversion. Okay. You'll either be given grams or a percent composition. What does the formula give you? If I write NaCl, what does that mean? <coughs> How many sodiums? One. One. How many chlorides? One. One. What's the mass of that sodium? We could pull the mass off our periodic table, but the information given in our formula is the amount or the number of them. What if I have a very large amount of sodium chloride? Would I really be looking at one? Probably be looking at a very large number of them. And instead of saying it one atom or one molecule, I could look at it as one mole. So from the formula, I know I have one mole of sodium. And for every one mole of sodium, I have one mole of chloride. If I'm given mass, well, to get to my formula, what units do I need? <coughs> moles. Can I convert grams to moles? Yeah, using the periodic table or molar mass. So I'll go through and convert, if I'm given grams, directly into moles. Once I'm in moles, I can move on to step two. I'll divide all the mole amounts by the smallest mole to get a mole ratio that mole ratio will then give me my empirical formula. What if I'm given a percent composition? Well, a percent composition is typically done by mass. So I need to be able to convert the percent composition into mass. Okay. So if I have a sample that is 90% hydrogen, how can I convert that quickly into mass? What if I had a 100 gram sample? How much of that 100 gram sample is hydrogen? 90 grams. 90 grams. We can use our percent compositions to convert into a mass by assuming we start with a 100 gram sample. Why do we pick 100 grams? 
per what? Per cent, and cent happens to be a hundred. So if we pick a 100 gram sample, the hundreds cancel and we'll be left with whatever the percent value was. Right? And that can simplify our calculations. So that's straightforward, everybody's good? Don't need any examples? So you did have in the past? I actually had some examples, I was just being a jerk. But I could go through and do questions from the test too. Uh, what's number 14? We'll do that in the next one, but yes. So, empirical formulas. Our subscripts from our formulas are ultimately a way to measure the number of atoms. Atoms aren't easy to measure, so we look at the moles of those atoms. So, if I take a look at this question, an unknown compound of radium oxide is found to contain 0.726 moles of radium and 12.3 grams of oxygen. That says of. I don't know why you have such a hard time reading that, guys. What is the empirical formula? So what do we have to do? Previous slide said, what do we start with? If we start with grams, what do we need to do? Convert the grams into moles. Okay. What am I starting with as far as the radium goes? Point seven two six moles. Moles. I'm already in moles. Sweet. Radium equals zero point seven two six moles. What was the oxygen? Twelve point three grams of oxygen. I need to convert this into moles. How do I convert it into moles? Well, grams of oxygen needs to disappear. What do I need on top? Moles of oxygen. Where do I find that information? Periodic, Periodic table. And I get? Um, Why am I allowed to do 16.0 as opposed to 32? It says oxygen what? Atoms. Atoms. I don't have to worry about the molecule. I enter that in the calculator and I get? My empirical formula has what units? There's a hint. It says so at the top of the slide. Moles. What units am I now in? Moles. Moles. So my formula becomes radium, 0 0.726, and oxygen, 0 0.769. Everybody like that as your answer? Why not? It's not a whole number. When we look at our ratios for building compounds, we want whole numbers. So I need to make those whole numbers. What can I divide those numbers by to get whole numbers? I will divide by the smallest of those two. Oh, that's what the, Mike's procedure said to do. That was pretty nice of Mike, as tall as that. Come on, snickering is not allowed. That was funny. What is 0.726 divided by 0.726? 1. So I get RA1, 0.769 divided by 0.726. 1.06. So 1.06 exactly 1. No, but. Yeah, this is, this is where you can love it. Enjoy chemists. Close enough. And our formula becomes RAO. Decent hot sauce. Not hot sauce. Pasta sauce. We're not hot sauce. They might make a pasta sauce or a hot sauce. I don't know. I just know they make a hot sauce. Potato sauce. One of those sauces. <laughs> Son of a. What's a potato sauce? <laughs> Tomato sauce. Tomato. Okay. So our empirical formula for that compound becomes RAO. Sorry, I need to walk in front of your picture. Okay. How did we go through and do it? We get them all converted into moles, divide by the smallest mole value, look at the whole number ratio. 
If we're lucky, everything comes out beautiful. What if we weren't lucky? Comes out a little messy. But the messiest it'll come out will be something like this. RA1 and O1.5. Can I have half of an oxygen? How can I get rid of that half? Can't round down because it's right in the middle. Can't really round up because it's right in the middle. How can I get rid of a half? Double it. Okay. Super rare for you to deal with within this class. So don't stress about that. But if you get values that come off by some factor, right, you can then multiply through by that factor to scale it upwards. Okay. An unknown sample was found to be composed of 24.0 grams of carbon and 2 grams of hydrogen by elemental analysis. What was the compound's empirical formula? So go ahead and try this one on your own. How do we start? Convert to moles. I've got 24.0 grams of carbon. How do I convert that to moles? One mole of carbon. One mole of carbon. 12 grams of carbon. 24 divided by 12 would be 2 moles of carbon. Do the same thing for the hydrogen. How many grams of hydrogen did I start with? 2.0 grams of hydrogen. And I get close enough to 2 moles. Now what do I do? Pick the smallest number. What's smaller? Two. Good. Divide them both by two and I get one. My empirical formula is C1H1, also known as CH. That is now my empirical formula. Why did I divide by two? So, no. The step goes, we pick the smaller of the two numbers of our mole values. Which is our smaller number? They're both two. So it doesn't really matter if I'm dividing by the same number. Okay? Kind of make sense? So you ready for the next one? And then I think we'll get to your question. Right. Your empirical is the smallest whole number ratio. The molecular is the actual whole number ratio. So an unknown sample is found to be composed of 24 grams of carbon and 2 grams of hydrogen. By elemental analysis, what's the compound's empirical formula? CH. CH. A small amount of the same sample was tested using a mass spectrometer. So mass spectrometers are these fun little devices. You take your sample, you throw it in the mass spectrometer, and the mass spectrometer blows it to tiny little pieces. Right. The biggest of those pieces will be the original piece. We now know the mass of our compound. Okay. So our empirical formula was CH, and we now know that the molecular weight, or the molecular, yeah, the molecular weight or mass to a mass of the actual compound is 78 grams per mole. What is the compound's molecular formula? Okay. So I heard one guess. Let's go ahead and start with the first guess because this is a possible way to answer this. I heard C2H2 for the correct formula. What would the molar mass be for a compound of molecular weight C2H2? How much does carbon weigh? 12. How many carbons are there? How much does hydrogen weigh? How, much, how many hydrogens are there? 2. This would equal 24 plus 2, which would give me a molecular formula or molecular weight of 26. Is 26 grams per mole the same thing as 78? No, what does that mean about C2H2? It's wrong. 
So you can try again. You can get C3H3, C4H4, C5H5, C6H6, C7H7, C8H8. That's a bit tedious. I wonder if there was a method that Mike discussed earlier and told you how to do this. It's roughly the same problem, different numbers. But yeah, we'll get back to that one. So, are you guys going to work on it now? Try and figure it out? This, um, so this was suggested by a classmate that noticed another pattern on this. Um, you can tell how interested I am in empirical or molecular formulas or solving for them because all I've really done is just done whatever the textbook does because it doesn't really get used in real life. Okay? So I didn't actually spend any time to come up with the proper pattern for this. So here's the proper pattern. How many compounds or elements went into our compound? Yeah, which compound or which elements? Carbon and hydrogen. Both of them are going to contribute a mass, right? Yes. Okay, what is the mass that carbon is going to contribute? 12. Times however many carbons go into this. But I don't know that yet, so I'm just going to say x. It's an unknown number. Plus, well, what's the mass on hydrogen? One times, well, how many hydrogens went in? Okay, we could go through and say why, but we have a little bit more information than that. Y would be the number of hydrogens. X is the number of carbons. We know our empirical formula. What is the relationship between the number of carbons and the number of hydrogens? They're the same, which means that's not Y. That is X. If we play around with some fancy algebra here, 78 equals x times 12 plus 1. Divide both sides by 13. We'd get x equals 6. It equals 6. What is 12 plus 1? Okay. What did Mike tell you to do? Well, in the formula, he said determine... The mass for the empirical formula. What is the mass for the empirical formula of CH? 13. Hmm. And the next step that Mike told you to do, what did he say to do? Take the molar mass, the mass for the actual compound, 78, and divide it by the empirical molar mass, which was 13. And that gets 6. Oh, those are the exact same things. Yes, they are the exact same things. Okay. One method is just a here, do it, and the other one is where that method is coming from, the origin of it. What is that x value or that 6 in reference to? It's the ratio of our molecular to our empirical. Our molecular compound happens to be six times larger than our empirical formula. How can I make my molecular formula then? Six times the size of CH, which makes it C6H6. Oh, that's kind of convenient. That happened to be the molecular formula for benzene, which we'd already talked about. Yay. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So you mean after I erased everything? Step three, multiply the empirical whole numbers, what were the empirical whole numbers? One and one by the number from step two. What was the number from step two? They weren't one, we'd have to multiply it by. Yep. Which gets us to, actually we can leave that there. The last question of the day, I'm fairly certain. See what happens? Let's clean up the top of that because we don't need any of the top of that. Question from the practice exam. Remind me of that number. Um, it's 180 grams per mole. Question 14. 
Yada yada junk. The molecular formula. Oh, what is the molecular formula? Galactose empirical formula. Is CH2O. The molar mass, we are told, is 180 grams per mole. <laughs> Determine the molar mass for the empirical formula. What was our empirical formula? CH2O. CH2O. What is the mass of C? 12. 12. What is the mass of H2? <coughs> Excuse me. 2. Mass of O? 16. My empirical mass is... Yep, yep, you did that right. 30. Step 2, divide the molecular molar mass by the empirical molar mass. The molecular molar mass was 180. Divide that by the empirical molar mass, which is? 30. 30. 180 divided by 30 is? 6. six. Seems like Mike has a thing for sixes. <laughs> Right. Multiple empirical whole numbers. Um, sorry, multiple. <laughs> multiple. No, that is multiple. Multiply. It's a Y. Mul right? Multiply. Did I fix that? Okay, so I did read it right. Multiply the empirical whole numbers. The empirical whole numbers were C, what? 1 times 6, so my formula becomes C6H12 O6. She might guess why some people had a hard time with that question before, right now, but now, are you okay? Okay? And with that, let's see, do we have anything else? Uh, don't worry about reflections. We'll pause on that. Um, now I'm really confused. <laughs> so I think this is just referencing the new content for this exam, the big pieces. Okay? Dimensional analysis is something we've constantly been using, so it's not really new content. The mole of an object is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, or 6.02 is fine. You can use 6.022 or 6.02. It's one of those just what did you memorize for the number of sig figs. Um, periodic table gives you the grams converted to moles. Balanced equations give you mole to moles. Molarity gives you moles to liters of a solution. And gases, if we are at standard temperature and pressure, one mole of a gas is 22.4 liters. PV equals NRT comes out of our gases. We have our limiting reactants or reagents. Percent yields, empirical formulas, molecular formulas. <clears throat> and that would be all of the new content. It in one slide. How hard could it be? Okay. So realize that you need to be able to process that. That's what those conversion factor slide is looking at, where those things are coming from, a little bit on examples. And then kind of your last thing, which we already talked about at the beginning. Wrapping it all together. The exam is Thursday. The exam is Thursday. Tuesday. It's Tuesday. You sent an email that said it was Thursday. Oh, no. I sent an email saying it was Wednesday. So it's next week. The exam is next week, Tuesday. It's Tuesday next week, right? It's whatever the schedule says. It's Tuesday. Yeah. So that means Thursday is pretty much a free-for-all for this exam. I would highly encourage you to come in with the practice exam and be like, I don't know how to answer this question. If you're like, I don't need any help. I don't believe you. <laughs> but I'm also, well, I might do a quiz just to get points for people coming in practice. Okay? So with that, we'll go ahead and end.